Day three of the August 2005 seven day retreat in Springwater. I left my little piece of paper upstairs so the mind is as blank as that piece of paper was before I wrote something on it. Don't remember, but it'll come. I don't know how much we worked through this question, what is your practice here in spring water, or do you get a practice assigned? What is meditation practice? But actually it always comes back to one thing, which seems so simple and so extraordinarily difficult to do. or you could say not to do. And that is to be with what is. To be with what is and to even learn to see what is because we are full of ourselves, full of our ideas of how things should be for us. And we don't see what is here. This is not a scolding from a pulpit, and it sounds like it, but it is so simple, and yet so, why is it so difficult? Because most meetings, not all of them, deal with what is that one doesn't like and what, what should be what I would like. This is what, what the Buddha actually said is the main cause of suffering for human beings. To desire what we don't have and not to desire what we have. Can you open to, to that in a very innocent way, let it sort of flow in and not immediately say yes but. Yes, but I have reason, and so forth. Let it flow in and, and let it sink in, we, we say. And in the course of your, daily, of your daily life, ask yourself, is this what is happening now? Not wanting what is and wanting what is not. Obviously, if there's something very wrong with what we're doing, with our home life, with where we're working, something very wrong that can be changed, then change it if you can, without making a big fuss over it. You could say, yes, but I can't change it. Well, then see whether you can live with it. That's what millions and millions and billions of human beings have to do to live with what they don't want, what is so hard to bear. If you, if you remember the, the pictures of the victims of the tsunami, all of a sudden, no home. Wife and all kids are gone, or half of them are gone, or the husband, the uncle. Nothing but devastation around one. And people have to live with it whether they want to or not. And some people, I recently saw a review of that area, of those areas, there were multitude areas were affected by how some people hammering, looking for pieces of scrap to put together to have 
at least a roof for the kids, some, some of them, ten kids. But often those ten kids aren't there anymore. The water has swept them away. So some people get busy and try to, to do something and often feel finally, and some person said that finally I have a crisis where I can do something rather than just wonder what's wrong with me or what's wrong with the others. It's something to, to grapple with emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, physically. So we, we are blind to our circumstances the way they are and wish for something that we dream about. If it's not a dream, if it's a possible reality, then do something to bring it about. Yes. En enormous energies can be aroused to change our condition. And then again, no matter how much energy there is, we can't change it. I grew up in, in Nazi Germany. We couldn't change the conditions. We had to live with it. Although. Some people did. Some people took a bag, maybe one suitcase, and got out. We didn't. So uh, some people kept their wits together and didn't need to, didn't want to keep their house or their pictures, their, their valuables and the beautiful fur furniture. That was all not important. What was important to get oneself and the family into safety. People did that, and others did not, and perished. So, uh, people ask, how, how do I do this to be with, I, I want this, it sounds good. So now we have a new desire, wanting to be with what we, uh, what we have, or what is there. And how do I not desire to be rid of what I hate. It's, it's not a how-to. It is this thing we've been talking about for two days. This slowing down, that's what retreat is good for. Really slowing down body and mind, slowing down so that it's possible to see what is going on from moment to moment. We're usually so hurried with homework and schoolwork and then comes the entertainment at night always in a rush to get ready, to get there, to, to make an appointment, to meet uh, friends, and it's always schedule and rush, isn't it? So now you can ask, how do I slow down? It's always, how do I do it? Just do it. Slowing down, learn it. To, to, to wonder, what is this moment if I don't think about the next one that I have to accomplish? <clears throat> I don't think of the next one that I have to finish. This is what drives us crazy. Thinking of the next <clears throat> moments and all, all the things that have to be done that are piling up on the desk. To me, a, a desk that is loaded with stuff is a, is a real pain. I try to have it empty. It's not always possible. And sometimes you kid yourself, you sort of find niches and nooks where you can <laughs> stuff things so you don't see them. It's, it, it helps. You don't see it all the time. But that's not the, 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 the real good solution. The good solution is to do it little by little, moment by moment. And as we were really at pains to describe by living through it. I can live through this in my memory, in my fantasy, and you can too. Living through tackling one job and looking at it, not just the idea, I have to get this done, I have to be finished with it, the desk has to be, has to be empty, but loving it, loving this doing, this moment. You could say, well, how do I love it? I don't know how it comes when you do it slowly and feel the paper in your hand and the pen in your fingers and 
the writing or the computer and you print it out and it works. The printer is obedient for once. It doesn't go on strike. <laughs> There are a lot of things that are very frustrating. <laughs> you know, you're very blessed if you have a good friend who has time to come over and help you with these darn computers and printers because we need them. I, I need it, unfortunately or fortunately. So to, to love it, to, to really pay attention to where did this finger press and what happened when the finger pressed on the, what do you call these things, Tasten hmm? okay. on the keys, huh? on the keys. Feel it. See how the stuff jumps and moves. It is really miraculous. You, you do one correction and the whole screen changes. Everything moves with one touch of a, of a key. So awaken to what happens around you as you do one little thing. And as you as you do that, alone and together with your family, with your friends, or alone, you, you will find, I can guarantee you almost, you will be more into it. It will be more fun when you take time to pay attention to what is going on with one movement of one finger. And that is not to be done sort of automatically, not automatically moving a finger. There's a, a very famous and very gruesome koan, maybe you, you know it, about one finger Zen, where the, all the teacher did to teach, or was capable of doing, who knows, <laughs> he just lifted his finger, that was all. He had an easy time. He could have hundreds of students. All he did when one came in for doksan or for meeting is he raised one finger. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> None of this endless talking and endless not being understood and endless being asked the same question over and over again. Raising one finger. <laughs> really being there. Try it sometimes with your best friend and hope he will, won't, won't uh, suck you. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the story isn't finished because this isn't a gruesome thing yet. Uh, a young assistant of his, they started very young there in, in these monasteries, at least some of them. Uh, finally, when it was his turn again to go in, he raised his finger before the teacher did. finger now. You could interpret it and say there's a, there's a better, this is just an analogy or whatever you call these things. Whatever. So as the, as the boy ran out screaming because it hurt, you get a finger cut off, it hurts. He had something to feel. We'll talk about that too, because somebody mentioned as his problem, I don't feel anything. I don't feel pain or fear. So as that boy ran out, pain struck, the teacher called him, and the boy turned around, lots of tears rolling down his cheeks, and the teacher raised one finger. And the story goes, the boy was enlightened. <laughs> Now, I don't say any more would it were this simple because this is pretty awful. I don't think these methods uh, would, would go this days. We would have endless suits. <laughs> <laughs> this center wouldn't exist anymore. <laughs> We've had so, to pay so much money millions compensation for one finger so what I'm saying is it is not the teaching itself it is 
the presence. And you could say, I don't know what you mean by presence. So then keep that question in your mind. Don't just uh, say, well, I don't know it. I don't understand it, what she says. And I, I'm, I'm not using this kind of method of raising a finger, but I say things that you may not understand, like be with this moment rather than complaining about it. Be with it. Do you really know it? Are you really with it? Are you really there completely? And this becomes contagious. One person is with it, it can leap over to others. Because I have experienced it myself. When I first started this work, there were some people at that Zen center, when I waited in the line from having been on the toilet, waiting to find my spot, you couldn't just go in any place, you had to find your right spot. I was amazed how, how with it a lot of people were. And I thought, well, I'm not like that, I'm thinking. Uh, how stupid that I have to wait for my place or something. And some people really were with it, they weren't complaining. Now you could say, of course, let me insert this here. If you had been totally with it all the time with that Zen center, we wouldn't be here, would we? We wouldn't. So there are ways when you find that something is not to your, to your right feeling, then you do something. And you don't do it with with bow and arrow and shooting people or uh, spreading mischief and bad rumors and stuff. It's just, you leave without much fuss. You just leave and the way it was then was anybody who wants to come with me, come along. If not, stay. It's fine. Either way. So I'm not saying stay in Hitler, Germany at all costs. I'm not saying that. But find out what it means to be with the moment. Do you understand that? And if you don't understand it, make that your koan, if you will. Koan means something that is not understood and yet seems to have some resonance in one. Something vibrates with that command or with a sentence, with a suggestion. Something inside is vibrating. And I don't understand what it is. I don't know what it is. So what is it? What is this moment? I thought I knew, but there must be something to this moment that I don't understand, one says to oneself. And if it becomes your core, meaning your uh, riddle, it obsesses you, then you just ask that into darkness, into the darkness of not knowing. And yet you can repeat the question or whatever that puzzle is. Keep it in front of your inner eyes and ears and not know. Not know, just this enveloped in, enveloped in darkness of not knowing and yet wondering and having a, an inkling, a dark feeling that there must be something to this. I just haven't come upon it. What is it? Have you ever worked this way? It's an, an amazing way of working. Because as one sinks deeper and deeper into not knowing, into not knowing darkness, if you will, I don't mean scary darkness, but just not knowing, the mind seems to empty itself of what it knows, because all kinds of answers arise uh, from the bottom of, one, of one's mind, one's knowing, all kinds of answers. Well, it's this, of course it's that, but something rejects the answer. It says, no, this doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. 
that's not it, no, and this is not it either. So one looks at what comes up, looks at it, the answers that present themselves, and rejects them because they don't fit. If they fit, you know that they fit, and it's clear. It's not clear, keep asking. And watch all these pitfalls on the way. You read this in every legend, in every fairy tale, or uh, story about the heroes on, on their passage to, to find the treasure, or the, the princess, or whatever is, is sought treasure box, always on that, on that, um, well, what do you call it, uh, just seeking, seeking, seeking a, you can superficially call it a treasure hunt, needing to find out. Search. Need, hmm? Search. The search is the process, but what, not, not okay on that search. Yes, on the search there are a million pitfalls. And the greatest pitfall is self-pity. The word is right in there. Feeling sorry for oneself. Watch it. Are you in that pit of self-pity? How bad I have it in comparison to the others. And don't sink deep into it. It's hard to climb out of. And what we do is we try to find other people who reinforce us in our self-pity. So they help digging. Pit gets deeper and we have company. <laughs> so beware of looking for company. Often I say, beware of looking for allies. Because there will always be allies who want your company for whatever reason. Feel good about themselves helping you. Because we all like to be helpers, don't we? So what other hindrances are there? You find I can't list them all. They're endless <coughs> on our search. Quest. Quest, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That's a better one. In 1975, he was the translator <laughs> in Poland. So he's still translating. <laughs> <laughs> now, did I do something for your ego? A little bit, huh? <laughs> Don't be too quick to say no. <laughs> Just watch it. See, that's another pitfall. We say too quickly, we, we are too quick in salvaging our self-image, which is pure. <laughs> pure of such lowly uh, motives. You never had that image. <laughs> The hero, the wonderful book, the, the hero with a thousand oh, faces. Huh? <laughs> um, oh, you know the name of him too, of course. Let me, let me find it. No, you find it. Campbell. Campbell, yes, Joseph Campbell. Wonderful book as he's written about uh, the masks of God. A marvelous book. We highly recommend it. About what all is functioning as God and how it functions. So, where was I on this quest to give a talk? Oh, this, the difficulty or the, the seeming difficulty of being with the moment. And it, is, it has sort of uh, 
blinked through every talk, and I've done it with you, the, the slowing down, uh, slowing down with everything that is happening so that I can see it better, so I can hear it better and attend to it better. And with that growing attention, deepening attention, there comes a different state of mind and body. Find out, is that what you're coming here for? What are you coming here for? Are you asking yourself every once in a while, why am I here? Are you here to get answers for your problems, solutions? Is that why you're here? So people come for many different reasons. Uh, probably as many reasons as there are people here. And they change maybe in the course of one day or in the course of one retreat, or in the course of many retreats, one's, one's motives change. Old motives, which are seen as superficial, drop off. One wonders, how could that have ever driven me to come to a place like this? Because there are not many, many places like this. Believe me, people tell me who come here. here, what do we spend a lot of money and time to come to a retreat, just to see what it's like for the first time, that's understandable, you've heard about it, you want to experience it too, maybe you have read books, you want to get that wonder of presence, or we don't talk about enlightenment, but we talk about things that may come, become desirable to have to experience. And can I emphasize that this is not about getting experiences. If that's your motive, you will be disappointed. You could say, well, what you just said, to that, isn't that an experience? The slowing down, the slowing down and things dropping off, which were so crusty, which kept one so encrusted in old ideas, even though they seem so new and wonderful. What are you here for? I, I remember Krishnamurti, I heard him talk many times, at least in this country and in Europe. I never went to India where he really scolded the people something terrible uh, for their superficiality, etc. And what he said, but that wasn't just to Indians. He would say, you're coming to a deep ocean, and you're coming with a little spoon. Is that how you go to the ocean, with a little spoon? Or do you come up with a deep, huge bucket? If not, don't come here. Yeah, he was very rough. The older he got, the rougher he got, and maybe the same is happening to me. Is it? Am I rough? <laughs> if so, I want to say it's not for the sake of roughness, because it is just for the sake of the beauty of being here without, without all of our petty, petty desires to have what we don't have and not to want what we have. To wake up to this, to wake up to the life that seems to oppress us. And maybe some questions, yeah, quite rote questions, can become rote questions, is who is being oppressed? Who is suffering? Who is having a hard time with this and that? Find out. Find out. Let's see, of course, I am. Yeah, well, what is this I? 
I don't buy that as an answer. What is this I? What is this me? Which is so intrusive, so demanding, it's so, so blind. It wants and wants and wants, and it's so full of its own wants that it doesn't perceive the others. It doesn't perceive the, the needs and wants of other people. Or does it? Am I wrong? When, when we're full of ourselves, of our needs and our and how we're not treated right and how we could have it better, can we perceive anything outside of that? Or are the shades pulled? And not shades like these, these are beautiful. They let some light through. But the shades of me and ego, they let no light through. It's dark. And not the darkness I talked about before to question into darkness. Although you can use it that way too. Question into the darkness of ego, of me, me, meanness. Question it. And don't be defensive about it. Because that is not helpful. Because we all are. I, I get defensive, we all get defensive, but if somebody tells me you are defensive, maybe at first I say, no, I am not. But then I may look at it as you or I leave the room. Take a second look, take a second listen, and maybe find yes, there is something there, there is defensiveness, or was. Or, no, there wasn't. Find out for yourself. Don't buy what others tell you. So somebody said very, very sincerely uh, in, a, in a meeting, very genuinely, I don't feel much, although knowing this person as little or as much as I do, I don't even go along with that self-judgment. The, 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 the very looks of this person, the, the very ways uh, do not <coughs> manifest not feeling or numbness at all to me. Because one can look beyond superficial thought manifestations, how a person evaluates himself or herself. You can look past that. But at any rate, this was what the person felt that he doesn't feel. And he wishes he could feel something. Fear or anger is what he feels, he says. But that's about all, if I remember right. It wasn't quite clear. But then stay with that. Okay, stay with the anger. Stay with what comes, not with what you wish you would feel. Always subtract. Take the least that is there. Start with that. I'm so angry that she said this or that they made me do this. And not just justify your anger and carry it to a friend so that he, he will support you in your anger. Yeah, you have really reason to be angry. I would be too. It's not helpful. It can be helpful for one's feelings. Yeah, why do we do that? Because we feel better. We do feel more than we think. But look at what, it, what are the manifestations of anger. Ask it into this deep, dark well and let the answers bubble up as they will. And you may find, as this person did find, uh, in spite of what he uh, said about himself, he said is that underneath there is fear. The anger is just sort of a shield or a protective device. So you feel much more than you think and much more than you can put into words. So don't believe your thoughts and words, but just follow your feelings, how they express themselves physically and verbally in your relationship. Start with that little bit of whatever it is and watch you don't fall in the pit of wanting more. 
I want to feel more different things. I want to feel this and that. It'll come. Or maybe it's already there and you just don't recognize it. But it, it, it's true. A, a lot of people tell me that, particularly in the beginning of retreats, more so boys than, than girls. Maybe having been raised not to feel, we, we say, oh, a boy doesn't cry, or a boy doesn't feel like that. That's a girl who does that. So trace it and unravel it. I don't mean psychoanalytically, but experientially, as that anger manifests. Watch it as your best friend. What is it? What are you? Show yourself to me. And it will. Above all, do not kowtow to self-images. I am a person who doesn't feel as lethal. For one thing, it's not true, probably, very likely. And these are momentary states. There's nothing for keeps. Although all of our images seem to be for keeps, we don't want to let go of them. We hold on to them because that's what we think we are. What are we if we don't refer back to images? Or is this all we can do so that what you're really trying to say is I don't have any image of myself as being loving or, or what all, whatever all the feelings are. That, that we hear about or that have been written about. Read Read with a third eye and a deep inner wondering. What are they talking about? Or when you are in conversation with people who seem to exude a lot of feeling, ask, what, what, what is this all about? What, what are you feeling? What are you, what are you talking about? And get into a real exploratory conversation with your friends this is probably where it happened to you, didn't it? You were among friends and you found out, I don't feel like they do. So open it up. It's enough superficiality in this world that needs somebody to ask into the depths of things. And you can join together and have fun. What do we mean by feeling? interesting. Unfortunately, the meetings are very short, and I, I would beg you, I, I really yesterday I failed uh, some people. I, we, we got into one half hour uh, talk, and some people got short. Uh, so please, don't just make it my obligation to watch the time, but you too, when you start your question, it's your obligation too to keep watch of the watch. <laughs> keep watch of the time so that we're both uh, not doing what we did yesterday, go on and on and on, and other people go without, although these other people seem to be very willing to donate their time. But you shouldn't have to. You, when you come here, you are entitled to a time. And maybe you, if you feel that you still want to have it in spite of what you said, then talk to the coordinators and they will find a way to, to slip you in. Or, and of course we have uh, a private groups, one-on-one uh, -on -one too, with Richard. And those are much longer, aren't they? Half hour or? 20 minutes. 20 minutes.
being with the moment. And what is that? Yeah, make that your, if you have nothing else to do and find it's getting very boring, as people say that, sometimes on day three, four, or five, or maybe six, it gets so boring. So ask yourself, what is this boring moment? What is it? What am I talking about? Or what am I feeling? Yeah, what am I feeling? that makes me say it's boring. So find your questions in your, in your own life, in your own suffering, if you will, and enjoyment. The, the more attention that is given, that arises, the, the less boring it gets. Because anything that you look at carefully morning I was all kinds of little sand flies in my sink. And there's a, a light over the sink which is a night light and these sand flies love the night light. So I started running the water and they fluttered up and for a moment I thought oh let's let's rinse them down. And then I didn't. I thought let's watch them. If I don't rinse them down what do they do when they just sat quietly regarding the moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not that funny. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. too, if you watch animals, they spend a lot of quiet sitting time without moving. Why? We will end here for today. <laughs>